So Lieutenant Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski is going to discuss what happens inside the Pentagon's Office of Special Plans. And she should know because before she retired from the U.S. Air Force, that's where she worked during the run-up to the war in Iraq. Thanks. It's an honor to be here with uh, the distinguished people here and, and to learn what we're going to be learning. Um, I really uh, uh, wish that I had the benefit of Steve Snagoski's background knowledge before I uh, started working in the Undersecretary of uh, uh, Policy in the Department of Defense under, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, under Rumsfeld and uh, these, the uh, neocons there. Before, I, st I worked in Undersecretary of Policy, African Affairs, starting in 2000, at the tail end of the uh, Clinton administration. And uh, of course, Clinton had had the famous visit to Africa and, and that kind of thing. And so Africa was kind of a, a place where the Pentagon was even then. And of course, it's, it's grown in interest now. But it was an, a growing area of policy uh, interest. When the Bush administration came in, of course, uh, that changed. And, and for the first eight months until 9-11, 2001, uh, the Bush administration actually had shown very little interest in anything that it seemed we were doing in the Pentagon, certainly no interest uh, in sub-Saharan African policy or Central African policy, which is where I worked. Um, after uh, about six months after 9-11, of course, after 9-11, we all know, you know the, how things uh, shifted and changed. And our, our new set of enemies, of course, we're in, we engage in a war with uh, Afghanistan. Uh, but there was a growing interest in the Middle East, certainly in invading Iraq. And I know anybody who was in this country and even outside of this country at the time remember the calls for uh, that Rumsfeld made to scoop up all the evidence. If, if Iraq is involved, they must be involved. Saddam Hussein must be involved. So this interest in uh, invading Iraq was there. And a call went out in the uh, uh, headquarters quarters of the, you know, the top levels of the DOD in the staff there. The call went out. They said they need more people to work uh, in Near East South Asia, which is where Iraq policy, Saudi Arabia, Israel policy, all that is done. They needed people to, to work. And there were no volunteers um, because people had already, people smarter than me um, had kind of figured out what was going on over there. Uh, the, the head of Near East South Asian Affairs was Bill Ludi. Um, he had a reputation, which isn't really that he was a good guy to work for or anything like that. And so people look out for themselves in, in the Pentagon. You know, staffers, you know, they, they just want an easy job. Uh, no pain and as much gain as possible. This is what we're looking for. So there were no volunteers. And I, of course, was a lieutenant colonel at the time, and uh, I was made a volunteer. I was volunteered. And um, so, you know, I uh, did my interview with Bill Ludi, and I told him, I said, I'm not really a volunteer. You know, I'm, I'm uh, in my 19th year. Uh, I actually have other plans. Um, I don't have a real expertise in this area. And, um, you know, and, and, and by the way, sir, did I mention I'm not a volunteer? And he, uh, he said, fine, fine. And so I got to work. And one of the first things that was said to me, and again, you have to realize, my area of, of interest and expertise, I had some background in Saudi Arabian stuff, but not much, and it was not my, you know, Iraq certainly I knew nothing about. I also had never heard the term neoconservative. I mean, this word's been around since the 70s. I had not heard it. I did not know what it meant. I was, a, you know, a typical uh, libertarian-leaning Republican wearing a uniform, and the guys I worked with, my peers in the military, uh, tended to be just exactly that, liberty leave leaning, constitution-loving, Republicans, realist in their foreign policy perspectives. So we didn't know what neoconservatives were. We were not neoconservatives. And if, you know, we'd been happy to know if that's what we were, but we weren't. And we never heard that term. Um, so one of the first things that was said to me when I got into the new, my new office, and of course I was working North African countries, Morocco and that kind of thing. So I wasn't working uh, uh, Israel, Syria, Iraq, or anything like that. I was working near, I was sitting next to those guys. Um, but one of the first things that was said to me was, if you have anything nice to say about the Palestinians, don't say it here. Um, now, you have to realize, 
I gave very little thought at the time to Palestinians or Israelis. These are not people that I worked with. This is not areas that I had been, uh, that I had studied. Um, what I knew of, of Israel and Palestine certainly was problematic and troublesome, and you know, this is, is a hard situation. You know, I'm just the typical superficial knowledge. Um, so I was actually shocked that someone would think that I would even have an opinion that I would say anything about Palestinians or, or Israel, but I was warned. I was warned in advance by someone who saw himself as doing me a favor. You know, if you have anything nice to say, don't say it here. That was that kind of uh, uh, really, you know, these sign of warnings, they go further than just the warning because now I said, why? That's so strange. Why would someone say that to me and why would it matter and all this? So, um, I, and then of course, I was educated by uh, my other uh, compad compatriots there in the office, uh, colonels, uh, Navy captains, people with um, more experience than me, people who had worked for Bill Ludi, had worked for Doug Fife, had worked for this administration's uh, Middle East uh, policy analysis uh, folks and, and policy makers. And they kind of set me straight as to what was happening. And what, although it wasn't said that way at the time, what was happening was a realistic and preferably non-interventionist foreign policy in the Middle East was being, there was a battle between that and what I have to say is a fantasist, interventionist, and neoconservative foreign policy. A po foreign policy that is aimed at just what, what Dr. Snagoski said, um, a, a aimed at destruction, aimed at um, destroying stability of various enemies. Now, whose enemies? Well, they weren't United States enemies, but they were enemies of another country, and so I came to understand that that was a concern, and again, I'm just there serving out the end of my career, just trying to do a good job. I'm, I think I worked hard. I didn't hold it against them that I wasn't a volunteer. But, but I, I really was educated by these other guys that I worked with, many of whom sought employment in the military assignment system elsewhere because they really were not going to be told the kinds of things that they were being told to do. It was against their principles. Not enough that they would quit, not enough that they would stand up and say we're not going to do this, but enough that they would call their assignments officer and get the hell out of Dodge, which is what they did. Um, I was already, you know, my exit plan was, was uh, I had the, the, my eye on retirement at that time. So I said, well, I guess I can, I can do this, and I, I stayed there. And I made a few, I stood up against a little few things that I saw, one of, but very to no avail, okay? Now, I've got to clarify in the introduction, I didn't work in the Office of Special Plans. And from what I've just told you, you probably can figure out why. First off, I wasn't a volunteer. Second off, I was a realist. Third off, I wasn't an expert or a particular aficionado of this Middle East uh, particular policy, particularly Israel, Israel and Palestine, particularly Iraq. Um, so, but what I did do is I worked in the place from which the Office of Special Plans was drawn and formed. And in the summer of 2002, uh, this office was put together. We shared space for some time in our Pentagon offices and to the extent of being really crammed closely together, which I think, you know, you learn things when you're crammed close together with people for a period of time. The people who, uh, who were being brought in over the summer of 2002 were uh, political appointees almost to a man. Uh, there, there were a couple of uh, military folks from other agencies, but for the most part, they were political appointees. They were uh, uh, neoconservatives in their particular viewpoints. To some extent, they were academics or hangers-on uh, uh, in those academic policy-type circles. Uh, these folks came in, shared space with us over the period of the summer, and in August of 2002, we had a staff meeting. Bill Ludi presided over it. He hauled everybody in his office. It was a big office. We could fit there. We're, it's standing room only. And he explained to us, uh, he understood how crowded it had been, and we finally, he had found new space for what would be known as the Office of Special Plans, okay? And he, then immediately after that, he said, and don't tell anybody that that's what it's called. <laughs> because, you know, this idea of special plans and whatnot, he said, this is, this is the expanded Iraq 
desk. We had an Iraq desk of a couple guys. This now of 16 to 20 guys was the expanded Iraq desk. And that's how we were told to communicate this. Now, I don't, I mean, you guys are all, you've been around the block. <laughs> you, you don't tell somebody in a room of, uh, you know, 15, 20, 30 people, here's this, this is a secret. I don't want you to, okay, so immediately, of course, OSP became part of the terminology. Um, they did move into a vaulted area, and at that point in the fall of, uh, of uh, 2002, I did not see those folks uh, as a group on a routine basis. We did see individuals there. But here's the thing. We were told uh, at that same staff meeting in August that all talking points that had to do with, now this was the expanded Iraq desk, but all talking points that had to do with anything to do with terrorism, with WMD, or with Iraq, or with Saddam Hussein, a, a, a sh short list of topics, anything that we produced as staff officers, and we produced lots of papers, you can quite imagine, anything we produced that touched on any of these topics would have to be vetted and approved through the Office of Special Plans, and we were given the point of contact, and so that's, what, that's how we did it. So as a result of that policy, which of course all us good little staff officers do what we're told, we got to see what kinds of things were being approved and what kinds of feedback we were getting on the work we were doing and what was happening. So what was happening was a set of talking points originating from the Office of Special Plans was produced on a regular basis and updated on a regular basis. And those talking points in general were provided to us to kind of add on to all of our paperwork kind of as an, as an appendix, but it wasn't really an appendix. It was supposed to be integrated in with whatever we produced. And anything that we produced that went off the reservation, so to speak, policy-wise, would be deleted or, or changed. Um, a couple, you know, that's, that's a big thing. Um, this talking point set evolved over time. Uh, and the way it evolved, and I'm just, you know, reading the newspaper here, I, I don't know, I don't really understand what's happening in, in a larger scale. But what I did notice was whenever the New York Times or the Washington Post or some other media outlet publicized something that we heretofore had been considering classified that was in our talking points, it would then be withdrawn or reworded in those talking points. And a, a key thing, as many of you will remember, in December of 2002 was uh, the uh, unsubstantiated and later proved false report that Saddam Hussein had, had met with hijackers in Prague, Czechoslovakia prior to 9-11. This was this, this really vacuous uh, connection between uh, Saddam Hussein and 9-11. Of course, it didn't exist. It wasn't true. And when it was finally shown through FBI uh, documentation and other documentation within the system, within our government system, when it was finally shown not to be true, only then, only then, was it withdrawn from the talking points that we were feeding up the chain to all of the superiors, including Rumsfeld, and then presumably to uh, Dick Cheney and, these, and the, the administration. So uh, very reactive, very uh, publicity savvy, uh, very unscientific, very unintelligence. This is not how we do intelligence in the government. This is not how we do it in the military. It, it was really uh, playing fast and loose with the facts, even the facts that are being shared within the Pentagon. So there was a great sense that we, had, we were not only as staff officers lying to people up the chain and, and around us in the, in, our, in the Pentagon, we were being lied to on purpose. We were being, so there's a sense of that manipulation. Of course, a few years later, the whole country got a sense of, you know, when we found out how this had evolved, everybody felt manipulated. But it was very strange to feel that while you're wearing a uniform, doing what you think you're supposed to be doing uh, in, a, in a really otherwise tight organization. So. That's kind of, uh, in December, of course, in, in January, the, the final straw for so many people was um, uh, Colin Powell's presentation, which, of course, very much filled with uh, things we had been, we had been pushing that line from the Office of Special Plans in our documents. That's what we were told to say, knowing much of it was not true. And in fact, of course, he pushed it on the whole uh, world, knowing, I think, that uh, much of it was not true. Um, so this is kind of what they were doing. Uh, they were in a propaganda mode. Office of Special Plans was a propaganda office. It was not the expanded Iraq desk. It was a neoconservative propaganda office. Now, I want to go back just a little bit um, and to something that uh, Mrs. McKinney said uh, about, uh, you know, what is it, the zoo, knowing the, uh, the uh, now I can't remember her rhyme. I'm sure you guys remember it. But knowing the characters, knowing who's who in the zoo, basically. Okay. Um, 
when I came over to work for Bill Ludi in Undersecretary for Near East and South Asia Policy, work in the North Africa desk, when I did that, I really was disconnected in many ways from the White House. We certainly were not connected to the Clinton White House, and uh, we hadn't been up until 9-11 very well connected to the Bush White House either, although many military people thought Bush was a conservative. If, if you remember, he ran on a non-interventionist, limited government platform. So he was somewhat popular at the time prior to 9-11. But we didn't have connections. The policy, that was a separate branch. Well, you know, it, it's not a separate branch from the executive, but it was not something we worked with. But it turned out Bill Ludi was placed as Undersecretary of Near East South Asia by uh, Scooter Libby and Dick Cheney, who, where, which is where he worked on Dick Cheney's staff before he came over into the Pentagon. Now, he had a military background. He was a, a retired uh, Navy captain, which is a dime a dozen in the Pentagon. I mean, that, doesn't, that means nothing. Uh, it really, I, I'm not trying to you know, denigrate anybody's career or, or, or that, but it's just not that important um, there. So he was not someone who had achieved great rank in the Navy, and yet here he is at this position, but he had gotten there because he was going to push an agenda, a Scooter Liberty, Dick, a Scooter Liberty and Dick Cheney agenda, a neoconservative agenda, because there's, there's a name. Of course, Doug Fife, obviously he was our boss as Undersecretary of Policy. Where does he come from? Well, one of the things he, he had done that we all found was the clean break document, you know, and David Wormser, who worked in the Office of Special Plans, also an author of the clean break. So you have these folks who are propagandizing, who are gaining their position through political appointments, political appointments heavily influenced by a very particular genre of policy, not Republican, not Democrat, but neoconservative, which embraces both. And, and it is pro-Israel, not in a fundamental sense, but pro-Israel in the Likudnik sense, which is to, you know, if we do these things, it will be good for Israel. And of course, there's a whole other body of thought that says if you do these things, it will not be good for Israel. So anyway, I, the, my art, the, the observations that I made um, were published. There was an op-ed that was published. And then later, the American conservative, in the end of uh, 2003 and uh, through January 2004, did a three-part uh, they published my story in three parts, and it, it's uh, pretty interesting. One, one of the things that I will share with you here, if, if, and many people here may, all be, may already be familiar with it, but the comfort level and the access that the Israeli generals and these, the uh, uh, embassy, the Israeli embassy had to our, uh, to our leadership, to our building. And you remember, after 9-11, that building, you know, we locked down a little bit more. It wasn't just you could walk into the Pentagon. It was a process. One of the rules that had been changed was, uh, am I running out of time? I'm going to wrap it up really quick. One of the rules that had changed was a uh, number of escorts that were required for guests, and it was one to three. It had been much higher, but now if you had a large group, you had to have several escort officers. And uh, there were a group of Israelis waiting. Uh, whoever was supposed to have escorted them didn't show up, so a call was made. So a couple of us went down to, to bring them into the, to the uh, E-ring to visit with uh, Rumsfeld. And they were impatient, of course, as they'd been waiting. But as soon as they, as soon as we got there, they pretty much just went through, barged through, and we thought we were leading them to where they were going. That's not the case. We were basically running after them as they went to the office where they were quite comfortable, and they uh, went straight into uh, the office of who they were going to see. I can't remember who it was. But uh, the door was shut, and so the secretary jumped up from her desk and said, wait, wait, he has, he has a, 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 someone in his office. You'll have to wait. So I'm just like, you know, regular staff officer, and we're looking for something to do while we're waiting. And I, and I saw the sign-in roster, and I said, well, you know, maybe we can have these guys sign in. That'll, that'll be something they can do, because nobody likes to sign in, and you have to do it. Except these guys didn't have to do it. And they said, oh, no. And this is the secretary. Oh no, they don't have to sign in. Well, you know, this is the kind of access that uh, it just leaves a bad uh, taste in your mouth. It leads, it, it, it clenches your stomach. It makes you wonder uh, what's happening in, in how your country, how your country makes policy, how it uses the most powerful military machine that it has, and we have this powerful military force. How is it being used? So these are the questions that I asked, and of course I retired, and I'm going to step down. So thank you very much. Thank you.